Um, I'm going to go ahead and take a roll call vote. Uh, member uh, Vice Chair Belknap. Member Booth. Member Cannon. Member Klein. Yes. Member Earl. Yes. Member Hansen. Member Hart. Yes, ma'am. Um, <clears throat> Member Hutchings. Here. Member Hymas. Here. Member Mo Moss. Here. Member Norton. Here. Member Strait. Here. We had, uh, I was just saying before some of you got here, when we moved the date from the first weekend to the second weekend because of uh, Labor Day and such, um, anyway, it, it, it changed some responsibilities from some of our board members. And so we've had um, about four members asked to be excused today because of significant work uh, requirements that then they couldn't readjust and such, and then one who's on a wonderful excursion. So let's go ahead and get started. Uh, <clears throat> as authorized by Utah Code 52-4, this meeting is being held electronically with an anchor location at the State Board of Education offices. The public may also attend electronically. <coughs> uh, so I think what we will do is go ahead and turn the time over to Superintendent Coleman. Thank you. Nice to see you today. Nice to our see first, you. Our uh, first item on the agenda is um, our consent calendar that has four items on it, including the district contracts. These are only the contracts that are over $100,000. We have many more, but the board has that threshold for us that, that uh, you approve any that are over that mm -hmm. threshold. Um, our library collection policy which is based on your model policy. In fact, it follows the model policy that you all provided very closely with one exception. And that is um, instead of our local board, which is you being an appellate body uh, at the first level of appeals um, for any materials that are challenged, um, we, we inserted the USDB advisory council in that role and we ran that past them and they were they were very comfortable with that and then the policy also allows it to go to the state board of education after that which is you so with that one exception it follows the model policy that you have and then we have uh, a transportation contract amendment and the carry uh, the list of carry forward projects that you approve each year which is the leftover monies we had from last year's budget we use that for one-time projects around the, the buildings and our campuses Okay, thank you. Um, do we have board members, any items that you'd like to pull off the consent calendar? Member Hart? No. Okay. I was just going to make a motion. I didn't anticipate that question. Oh, okay, well, let's have the motion. Um, I um, <clears throat> move that the board approve the consent calendar as presented. Can I speak to that? If we get a second. Second. Yeah. <laughs> I think that is a brilliant change, uh, Superintendent Coleman. I think that it should be that group as the appellate. And I think that was the, that fulfills the spirit of the uh, intention in the model policy. So I love it. Great. Thank you, Member Klein. So it, I'm sorry, I don't have it right in front of me because I'm looking at you guys instead. Is is the library policy on the consent calendar? Yes. Yes. Oh, well, I would I would ask that that be pulled. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> Can we pull it now that we have a motion on the floor to approve the consent calendar? Or do we have to wait to see if that fails? I think that I be, think because there's a motion on the table that has to fail. She could amend it. You could okay. You could you could amend it or do a substitute motion, actually. Okay. Um, or you could or you could divide the question. Just, well, it, it, does that no. work for a consent calendar? It'd have to be a amendment. I think it'd have to be. So I I would uh, amend the motion. motion. Substitute motion. Wait just a second. Motion so to amend. 
motion to amend. make a motion to amend okay. um, to have uh, the library policy pulled. Okay. I'm not sure how to say it. <laughs> okay. Is so it'd be to approve the consent a calendar minus the uh, yes. library media policy. Minus the library policy. Thank you. Is there a second? I'll second because I'd like to know why. So. Okay. There's a second. Uh, so there's a motion on the floor to approve the consent calendar minus the library policy. Those in favor say aye. 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 Okay. Going out loud, Arthur. That, that motion. We need oh, to vote. You know what? We I have apologize. To I have things. to do. I have to do a roll call on a virtual meeting. So I'll quickly do that. Unless it's unanimous, you don't have to. Right. Uh, Vice Chair Belknap? Yes. Uh, member, did Member Cannon, Member Cannon? Uh, no. Member Klein? Yes. Make sure I know what I'm voting on. Uh, member Earl? Yes. Member Hansen is not here. Member Hart? Yes. Member Hutchings? Yes. Member Hymas? No. Member Lear? Oh, sorry, she's not here. Member Moss? Yes. Member Norton? No. Member Strait? <clears throat> Member Strait, Brent Strait? No. Uh, six. That motion fails. And I would be a yes, but that motion fails still. Uh, so we have a motion on the floor then to approve the consent calendar. Uh, and I'll, seeing no further discussion, I'll take a roll call vote on that. Um, Member Belknap? Yes. Member Klein? No. Member Earl? Yes. Member Hart? Yes. Member Hutchings? Yes. Member Hymas? Yes. Member Moss? <laughs> yes. Member Norton? Yes. Member Strait? Yes. That motion passes with Member Klein opposed. Uh, Vice Chair? Yes. This is Janet Cannon. You skipped me. I'm a yes. I, I thought I, oh, that's because I had you crossed off because you weren't here when I started the meeting. I apologize. Oh, sorry, I, I logged in, what, two minutes late or something. Apologies. I'll circle you to remind myself that you are actually here now. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks. Um, okay, so we'll go ahead and uh, turn the time back over to Superintendent Coleman to discuss um, the, or actually we're going to Director MP, correct? Yes, that's correct. That's the year-end financial report. Good afternoon, Madam Chair and board members. Uh, let me start my video here. I apologize. Uh, the financial, we've got two financial reports to present. The first one is for the fiscal year that ended June 30th, 22. The second one is for the first month through July 31st, of fiscal year 23. So let's just talk first about how the end of the year has turned out. The good news is we are financially solvent. Everything worked out really well this year. Our revenues, which really are our transfers from our state and from your office, totaled 49.5 million. Our expenses, we're 47.4 million. And so we've got about 2.1 million left over. 
And this is pre OPEB, which is the other pension employment benefit costs. And last year, those costs were about $240,000. I talked with the state finance director today. They're hoping they get that in the next week or two weeks. So we're still not officially closed, but we're going to close the books having more inflows than we did of expenses uh, and uh, approximately around $2 million. Any questions that you may have, I've got the report right behind that is the budget status report that gives all the salient detail of the numbers that we just summarized. I have a question if no board members do first. Um, <clears throat> could, you, could you just briefly explain I probably should know this, but can you explain about the pension? Is that our office that has a delay in sending that to you? You said you were waiting for the state director of finance, or are we waiting for a disbursement from we, the legislature? We, what are we, what's the holdup on that? We are waiting for the state division of finance to get that number from their consultants. Okay. And so they're doing the calculations for all the employees throughout the state. And then they break it out based on and will give us our expense for the schools for the deaf and the blind. So uh, we're not waiting on your office uh, for that. So are they um, held to a consistent calendar or are we just subject to whenever they get it done? We're kind of at their mercy. They try and get it done towards the first to the middle of September. And so if we go two weeks out, they'll be a little bit later than what they historically have been. Interesting. Thank you. Member Hutchings. Oh, sorry. Was that, was, were you going to say something else? No. Okay. Member Hutchings. Uh, I didn't have anything. I don't, is something. Right? Oh, I just, I see a hand on your screen. Oh. I don't. I'm let me I don't have one up. Let me see. Sorry. Does anyone else see a hand on her screen? Am I the only one that sees a hand on her screen? You know what? That's mine. That's my problem. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Darn I'm putting it, words I was in your for mouth. Another question. Get yeah. me there. <laughs> I, I'm putting words in your box. No okay, I'll just keep going yeah. on the report if that's Thanks. okay, Madam Chair. Sure. The number of students that we served at the end of June was approximately 2,508. Our balance in our land grant enrichment fund is 410,320. The donated fund was 282,846. And our foundation balance was 1,323,095. Then if we can skip to the enrichment fund projects and kind of give you the snapshot as of the year end of the million five hundred and twenty six thousand dollar projects that the advisory council recommended to you and that you approved back uh, last year, we have spent a million four hundred thousand three hundred ninety five dollars, leaving us three hundred and twenty five thousand six hundred dollars remaining to carry forward into to next year so those monies don't lapse and as you may recall we've talked on a number of occasions about this audiology van that's taking two plus years for a manufacturer to build we're hoping to get that sometime late this year first part of next year and that's two hundred thousand dollars that's encumbered so that would leave us 125,605. Which brings me back to the previous financial report, just to bring to your attention. Uh, you may recall we had 49 million of inflows, 47 million of outflows, leaving us left over $2 million. Now we're able by the state to retain 5% of those total revenues and transfers collected. So our revenues are about 50 million times 5% is just under 2.5 million. 
So we should be under that number by the time everything is said and done. So anything over, if we get any surprises and receive monies that we weren't anticipating here in the next week or two before they close out the accounting records, we may have to give some back to the state. I don't anticipate that right now. So any questions about our carry forward balance or the enrichment funds, Madam Chair? I don't see any hands, but I'm wondering next month, it might be helpful, even though we have this in backup, it just for you to screen share um, so we can, we can see the uh, numbers visually also. Okay, Sybil usually does that in the past, but you know, I'd be happy you know to what? do that. I I think that's my bad. I asked Sybil to make sure I could screen share for one item in my superintendent's report, and I should have just done the whole agenda this whole time. So sorry about that. It's okay. It's not a big, big deal. It's just a little helpful to hear it and see it at the same time. So thank sure. you so much. Um, Director Envy, did you have anything else? Yeah, we just have the first period of July of fiscal year 23. I'm just going to go through this really fast because there's really, I mean, we're financially solvent. Our inflows were 3.3 million. Our expenses were just under a million, leaving us 2.3 million more in revenues and cash. Really doesn't mean much. Payroll really hasn't begun to pay our educators. Uh, so we'll, I think August and September, September are going to be more meaningful. Our balances are almost identical in the enrichment fund, land grant trust fund, the donation fund, and the uh, foundation uh, account. And then we really haven't spent much money in the enrichment fund projects uh, for the year. Let me just flip to that. We've only spent, there's like $100,000. No, I'm sorry almost $36,000. So we've got a lot to span throughout the fiscal year. So that's my financial report. I'd be happy to answer any questions or go into any more detail on July if anyone would be uh, so desire. Okay, hey, I'm not seeing any hands. Thank you, Director. Hey, okay, you're welcome. Thank you. Appreciate it. Superintendent Coleman. Thank you. Um, I have uh, just a few items today on my superintendent's report. Just generally, overall, we've had a strong start to the school year. It's been great, exciting to have everyone back. Our HR director mentioned the other day, he said, well, we're definitely back in school. So <laughs> I know he's handling all the people that have come back. And um, we did have an exciting first football game ever in the state for the School for the Deaf last week. And uh, we're, we're so happy to have uh, board member Davis and board member Earl and board member Lear that came and, and it was hot as could be out there. We played at Judge Memorial High School on their field, but it was so fun to see the, the community come out and we barely lost. Um, I don't know what the score was, <laughs> but it was something like 36 was our score. So we scored, we played really well. The other team scored less than a hundred points. And so it was really a great game. It was super fun. And the kids had a blast. The next game is tomorrow on Saturday at East high school in Salt Lake at, is it at 11 o'clock in the morning? And so they're, they're roaring and ready to go. And um, it, it's been it's fun to see that. Superintendent Coleman, do you know if it's 11 o'clock when the game starts or is that the warm up? Is it 12 when the game starts? The game is scheduled to start at 11. Okay. Okay. There was a mix up last time where we were off by an hour. It started at seven, but we were all told six. But all I right, believe tomorrow you. it's 11 o'clock. That will also be our only home, our last home game of the year. The rest of our home games, we are, the rest of our games we have scheduled are all around the state in various places. And so, uh, it'll be it'll be pretty fun. I'm uh, so sad. My son has a soccer game in Utah County the exact same time, but yeah. we're members. It's a fun experience if you didn't get a chance to go last time. Yeah, and the kids okay. are loving it. And as a guy that comes from uh, my home neighborhood here has a football team that has only won like one game in the past six years, you can still have a lot of fun playing football without necessarily winning every game, right? So... That was that was really great. Uh, another item, uh, 
I just wanted to let you know we're making progress on our annual report. We will have that for you by your next board meeting so we can submit it to the legislature uh, before the November deadline that they, they have. And we're, re, we're kind of looking at redoing some things for future reports to make it even more accessible, especially in light of the, the key data that the legislature and the board both have been asking us for at the end of last year. And so we've been doing a lot of work internally on how to provide those numbers. And I'm excited to show you that uh, all next, next month. Um, we, um, the last thing I wanted to show you, and this is what I will share the screen with. Let's see, no, that's you. Um, let's talk to... Okay, now I'm going to share the screen. Okay, I hope you can all see that. This is um, an update. Some of these slides you've seen before, but um, as you're aware, we are required by the legislature um, to go to the Executive Appropriations Committee in September to report on the work done by the board and by the Division of Construction and Facilities Management, DFCM, um, to fulfill this statutory language that you have on your, on your screens right now. And essentially they wanted us to report back before they release all the funds for the St. George and the Salt Lake High School buildings, um, the JMS expansion high school. Um, it says before October 1st, which meant for their September, I think it's on the 20th, Tuesday the 20th, we'll be going before them. In order to comply with this, we've been working very closely with uh, DFCM. They've hired an architect has helped us do space studies and, and they're doing the cost estimations right now. And so DFCM is preparing all of that for the legislature in the next couple of weeks. And I wanted to show you the progress that we've made. First of all, with the uh, high school, on our Salt Lake campus. If you remember, this is the yellow box here is the, the parcel that we purchased to add extra office space and classrooms for the high school students that don't have that. Um, we This is an old slide. It's what we first started using to start the space study, talking about the offices, classrooms, and so forth that we needed. This is what the architects came up with. Um, this is how they work. And I, every time we have one of these meetings with them, I thought, oh, I just want the board to see all of this. And what they do is they take the, the actual spaces needed on the left, and then they create these little colored blocks of every single space that is needed in that building. And that's off to the right here. And then from that, they have come up with a floor plan. They, it's kind of like putting a puzzle together. And so on the left is the first floor and it has an open, lobby at the bottom right corner with the two red arrows, uh, which are the two entrances that can be used to access that. And that's open, the two, uh, both stories. Everything else is a story each. So you've got a front desk and a stairway there and they built it so that the, or they designed it so the deaf um, people would have visibility to the doors for safety. We have all of our office space there, or a lot of it you can see behind the front desk and the conference room. And then the big green blocks up on top are the classrooms. Uh, with the bathroom in between, and um, also a weight room, an exercise room, which we don't have on this campus. We do in the OEC building, we have showers, which is great, and the gym, but this is the actual weight room so that our basketball, football, and volleyball teams can all get their exercise like the other students do in other schools. Now on the right, you see the second floor. We've got, um, oh, on the first floor, we have a robotics classroom. We built it so that there's a wall that's between the two general classrooms, there's a wall that can move out so we can have a larger meeting space if we need to do like professional development, teacher training um, during uh, holidays or, or professional development days. And then upstairs, it's a very similar layout with a science classroom and uh, a couple more general classrooms. And here's what the just the kind of the artist sketch is. If you remember the side of our OEC building on the right side there, this is what the building will look like next to it. It'll just sort of look like part of the campus and we'll have a crosswalk there. And they plugged it into their CAD system and they came up with a rendering like this so that it matches the building and the flow of the building with it, even though it's a separate, a separate site there. 
Um, in your packet, you also have the details. This is a slide we had before. These are some of the considerations that DFCM took into account. And that's the Salt Lake High School. On the St. George School, as you remember, we had previously identified a site uh, that was in between an elementary, a middle school, and a high school, and a preschool building even. And um, what happened is uh, Washington County um, offered to sell us a, a, a different site. And so it's just going to be a preschool instead of, at this point, we were going to build on this little lot here, we were going to build everything that we would need for the foreseeable future. But we've significantly reduced that strategy now. And they found us this building that was previously used as an adult high school building. And we're going to, the FCM has been down there with our facilities people and walked through the building and they're coming up with the plans for that. This is a little lot in back that will be transformed into a very nice playground for the deaf and the blind. And um, based on these original, these original numbers don't apply anymore to everything that we were looking. We were looking at a whole USDB program there. Now it will just be a, um, a preschool building. And so we did the same process with the space study on the left. And then they took the little blocks of colored um, classrooms and audiology booth and kitchen and eating room and so forth. And this is what we've come up with for the site design at this point where we have the existing building. I'm, yes. I'm, I'm sorry to interrupt you. Bef before we go on to many more slides, I remember Norton's had her hand up for a bit. I'm nervous if we get too far past where her question was. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's no, Can we no stop problem. for just a second? Member yes. Norton. Thank you. I had a question back on the Salt Lake building. Um, okay. I, I, I appreciated the um, thoughtfulness of adding some um, space that you could expand and contract as your needs um, changed for different meetings, et cetera. I'm wondering um, if other flexibility maybe could be built in with that atrium in the in the opening part um, that as your needs there increase or grow, that that also could be used, you know, if, if planned now could be used in the future for expansion space if needed. It, it might be able to, yeah. We I think this will fulfill our needs really for the next 20, 30 years at, at a minimum, um, because that's part of the reason we built these um, classrooms with flexible opening walls. Um, and we also have the, the facilities we're using now, like the stage and other things in the OEC. So yeah, we it's, it's possible. We could always renovate something if we needed to later. Okay. Great. I'm just going to look really quickly, see if you have any other questions. Thank you. I, I don't see any. Um, and I'm just checking back up again really quickly. Do we have this in our backup? You do. This do is we in have that, sli that one slide. Okay. Great. Um, so back Thank to this, I, I'm pretty much, I'm, I'm getting pretty close here to the end. I just wanted to update you on this before we go to the EAC on the 20th. So as you can see on the diagram here, the existing building is there, the parking lot to the right of it, and then that play area will be improved. And the architects have recommended for the safety of the children that we install this colonnade outside and we create an entrance here adjacent to the parking lot instead of the current entrance that is out on the street. And that way our vans can drop the kids off and loop around the parking lot like they do at our other campuses. And it will also have a little, you can sort of see a little fence all the way around that playground. And when they go out to play, they will go out that, that vestibule door and they'll be contained and they won't be subject to traffic or cars or anything. And so <clears throat> DFCM is currently kind of reviewing all of that information from the architects. They're gonna stress it and um, get the costs as, uh, as efficient as they can before they present with us on the 20th to the executive appropriations committee. And that was my, that was my update on that. I'd be happy to answer other questions if you have. What time again is that EAC meeting? It's currently scheduled for 3 PM. Sometimes right. they, they change at the last minute, but. That's right. That's Thank you. Member Earl. 
Thank you for the presentation. I do find that fascinating. You can say it is what we need and then let's figure it out, right? Yeah. Um, so with that in mind, this is just, you don't have another facility down there, just that you have the portable units, is that correct? Right, we have the portable unit with four classrooms, which will become our elementary classrooms into the future. And, and then um, as far as upper elementary, middle school and high school in the future, we're just gonna try to work with this, the district to uh, include us as part of their capital development plan in the future. So that okay. as these kids arrive, we're, I'm hoping we don't, well, I know it'll be long past my time. <laughs> Anyway, this should this should really get us the next 10 to 15 years, unlike our other buildings, which we think are built now to satisfy the needs of USDB forever, uh, really, for, for at least 50 years or so. That that was the standard before. Um, so I think kind of that's when when um, that building was identified, we just shifted that strategy and it, it should be OK for a while, for a good long while. Okay, that's what I was wondering about with those older students. I know that that's such a benefit up in this area and that parents drive from all over the place, right? And, yeah. and not having an actual facility down in Southern Utah, but it sounds like you've been able to make those accommodations with the school district itself. Well, they've, yeah, just in general in conversations, they said, yeah, we'll find a place for the middle and high school students. That's always concerned us in the past because districts are well-meaning, but when it, when it comes down to, to needing space for their programs or for ours, they always take their space first. It's their space. And so, but where Washington County is a little different, we're hoping that since it's one district, it's really mostly their kids too. And then some Iron County and a couple from around surrounding areas. But I think, I think, I think we'll be able to work with them for the older kids and okay. um, we'll just go for there. That's what I was wondering, because um, the original space was multi-use, right? It was broader. Right. So, right. okay. Thank you. Well, thank you, Superintendent, and all of you from USDB. We appreciate you coming and, and spending time with us today. Um, did you have anything else, Superintendent? If not, we will stay and continue lots of meetings and... <laughs> Okay. I, I didn't have anything, but I, I usually ask each of the associates if they, if we've missed anything that they think the board should know. So Susan and Michelle, are you good? Or do you have anything you'd like to add to me? I you know at this, uh, at this point, I'm good. So I, I know you, you guys need to get onto meetings. Okay. I have just one thing to make sure, well, as you guys are approving, you've approved today, five contracts those are the ones over a hundred thousand. I just want to make you aware that we have actually 71 contracts. So if there are, of the, those are the five that are paying that, that are paying us the rest. We provide at no cost. And there's a large list of students there. So I just wanted to give, give you an awareness level that we actually are serving the vast majority of the state with no cost. It's just those five districts that are part of the 3% that have to pay. So yeah, we're doing a lot of work out there. Thank you. And we'd love to see you on Saturday. That would be great. Thank you so much. We appreciate all of you. Have a great day, thanks. Thank you, you too. All right, um, board members, I think we'll go straight into our meeting unless we are required to do an additional roll call vote. Um, maybe our executive assistant uh, child could let us know. We can go straight in. Okay. All right. Um, <clears throat> we'll go straight into our meeting where we are considering um, business cases in a continued way. Uh, I sent a an email out letting everyone know that we'll consider the um, <clears throat> the cases that have not been brought forward first and then amended cases. And then finally, we'll have a discussion on WPU, potential WPU ask. So the time is yours, members. Um, Vice Chair Belknap. <coughs> so Chair Davis, I actually have two that I'd like to bring forward. Should I just do one now and then wait my turn? How would you like that to happen? Um, well, since I only see one other hand, go ahead and do them both. Okay, thank you. I'd like to bring forward the um, FAFSA completion incentive uh, systems for LEA. Okay, do we have a second? 
I second that. Okay. That was like three people at one time. I'm not sure. D Sybil, did you get one of those? Okay, great. Thank you. Um, we have a motion on the floor that the board moves the draft business case for uh, FAFSA incentive system for LEAs to be supported for the 2023 general session. Would you like to speak to your motion? Um, just a little bit. It's a 1.5 one time, 1.5K um, request for one time money. It's a pilot and it is not re a requirement, but it would be an opportunity for our students for, uh, I think it provides um, equitable resources across the state and help for our students to enter college. Uh, thank you. Member Norton, you had your hand up next. Are you speaking to this or are you in queue? Uh, I am in queue. Okay, Member Earl. Yeah, I, I'm i not a fan of this. Maybe someone can tell me, what is the, I'm trying to look, the actual incentive is what? The districts get money if they have so many filled out? What does that incentive actually look like? Sorry, I, I, my page is actually covered on this. Um, I think we could bring forward um, Nathan Okay. Is he the one? Is he the contact on this or is it someone else? So what no, is this? Nathan. Yeah, I so some Nathan. kids. Okay. Yeah, I think it's Nathan. And um I, just to just to a little bit of historical remembering, uh a year plus ago, the board considered having FAFSA as a graduation requirement. And we uh, we're not in favor of having a, a FAFSA application as a graduation re requirement, and we directed staff to go back and see what was happening in the country and or in other places and to see if they could come up with an incentive program versus a requirement program. And so this is what they're um, this is what they came up with um, is um, Nathan Auk, are you with us? Okay, I'm not seeing him. Let's take a couple other questions and then maybe some, is there someone else from staff that's here that could answer the question from, I, I think I understand that it will look different per LEA, but is there someone that could verify that for member Earl? Uh, Dr. Norman, do you- Yes, I'm reaching someone? out to Nathan right now. Okay, let's go ahead and take a couple more questions then and we'll we'll circle back as soon as he gets here. Um, member Hymas. Sorry, that was my same my same question, just kind of what the incentive is, what that looks like. I'll I'll okay. wait. Okay. Um, <clears throat> member Straight. You're muted. I, I'm just in queue. Sorry. You're in queue. Okay. So you're in queue after board member Norton. Um, Vice chair, do you want me to go on to my other request and then we can flip them? Um, I'm wondering if we can do that with a motion on the table. Let, I'll speak to it for a minute and then okay. hopefully we'll get Nathan here um, while we still have the motion on the table and then we can move to the next one. Um, I guess we could, if he doesn't get here soon, we could motion to postpone or, or to whatever. Uh, I'll, I'll just speak to this a little bit. You know, we, um, it's, it, this has been an interesting topic that has resurfaced on the board quite a few times. And, um, I think when we look at, at our FAFSA situation, you know, those who are, <laughs> basically we do have students that leave a lot of money on the table money according to backup that I read that would not have to be paid back money that would help pay for tuition and such um I've never been a fan of having a graduation requirement or forcing someone to fill out a FAFSA application for a requirement for graduation but I have appreciated for example and I think we talked about this a couple years ago in our board meeting when um for example, like the, the Ken Garf company did an incentive 
to if you fill out your FAFSA application, you get a $50 gift card. And, and, and a lot of kids were figuring out how to do it because of that and thinking more strategically about college. The reason I think we may need to also do some incentive is as I've looked at some research, it was interesting when they surveyed students, there's quite a misunderstanding from our students about FAFSA. And for example, um, when students were asked <coughs> how much money, how, how much money do you think is appropriate to take for a college loan? <coughs> they were saying $10,000 a year. And then an additional question was, how much loan do you think you would take to get through college? And like uh, 70% of the respondents, so there's discrepancy saying like $20,000 a year, which really is a misconception. And so I think some of our students are not pursuing higher ed, not because they um, maybe have an ideological predisposition against taking a Pell Grant or a loan or something of that nature, but, but they think that it's, it's impossible to accomplish the task based on the amount that they would take. So I think that there's some instruction to be done here, and I think an incentive program would be great. All right. Thank you, Chair Davis. Nate yes. Ock is on. Nathan Ock, thank you for joining us. We have some questions. Um, board member Earl and board member Hymas would like to know what these incentives would be, what, what the program would look like. And I'd like you to expand a little on, I noticed you said Texas is doing this in the backup. Could, could you explain a little bit about what they've done and what they found? Yeah, uh, Nathan Ox, STEM coordinator and early college specialist for the Utah State Board of Education. Thanks, Chair Davis, for, for those questions. Um, and uh, <laughs> my apologies for, for not jumping on uh, immediately upon the start of, of these conversations and missing the question. So um, I think that we have Melanie Heath from the Utah System of Higher Ed. I was talking to her earlier and she said she had the link. Um, but she may be a little bit behind as well. Um, so she'll have uh, really specific um, answers to the kind of FAFSA background question with regards to what you'd mentioned about Texas. Um, and, and I appreciate you mentioning the, the kind of historic perspective that we've had on this conversation. Uh, I, the, it, it seemed like it was the will of the board when we talked about this a couple of years ago to, to consider incentive systems versus uh, like a, a system that would be opt in on a mandate or opt out of a mandate, uh, like you mentioned. So um, it was it was right after that circumstance that Superintendent Dixon asked me uh, to bring together some stakeholders from uh, across systems, both in the Utah State Board of Education, as well as a higher ed system to, to talk about uh like ways that we could increase FAFSA completion in Utah at, at the time. Um, and, and still to this day, we have one of the lowest uh, FAFSA completion rates in the country. And so um, it was that group of stakeholders that kind of came up with, with the possibility for incentivizing systems uh, to, to kind of leverage their own community resources in uh, figuring out what was best for their communities to increase those rates. Um, so uh, th this incentivized system was was predicated upon uh, a system that Texas uh, kind of piloted a few years back, which basically uh, issues uh, grants to um, LEAs that are uh, built on achieving like particular metrics. So it, it, it doesn't automatically mean that uh, LEAs that are the highest achievers are going to be the one that would get the, the, the money, but uh, we'd have the opportunity to establish metrics by which uh, grant money would be um, given to those LEAs to uh, continue to, to kind of um, work on increasing FAFSA completion within uh, their, their LEAs. And we've actually just uh, completed a, a dashboard in Tableau that provides some transparency across communities for the state with regards to the levels that they're at, regardless of, of what the board decides with this particular business case. Um, so um, the, uh, like, I, I'm trying to read uh, a few of the, 
the text messages coming in. So um, the the money would be broken up into two years uh, worth of funding, uh, despite the fact that it's it's a one time ask. And uh, the first year of that funding would be an opt in circumstance for those that uh, were interested in participating and um, kind of committing or assuring that they're going to leverage the money in increasing um, their completion rates within their community. Um, and uh, the, like LEAs would use this money on things uh, like um, I, the, we have strategies that we have kind of gathered from communities that Melanie Heath could speak more specifically to. Um, I'll text her to see to, for her to jump on early um, so that, that she can answer these questions better. Melanie Heath's a, um, a um, um, higher education uh, leader. Okay. In, at the Utah System of, of, of Higher Education. I'm not sure what her title is exactly at the moment, but- um, Can the, we take a couple more questions while we wait, unless you have more info for us? Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Um, I, I don't know who's in queue and who's, Member Hart. I think it might be better if I wait until um, we get our, guess on so never mind i take my hand down okay member earl yeah i i have a couple other questions around this is this and i maybe maybe this is what's going to be answered i just don't feel like it was answered yet was is this incentive so to speak to pay for people to help people fill out help students fill out the fafsa so it, it's funding people or is the incentive going to kids or, um, I wasn't clear on that. Did I, so, unless I missed it. Chair, if, if I may. Yes. Yeah, so uh, the the money could be spent on on exactly what Chair Davis had, had mentioned as a possibility. It could be specific incentives for students, but the educational, the LEAs are, would have the, the ability to use this money in whatever way they identified what would be the most successful way in increasing uh, participation for, for their students in the FAFSA. So this could look like holding parent nights. It could look like hiring uh, an extra counselor or uh, community access uh, counselor. It could look like um, providing incentives for, for the completion of FAFSA. It might look like um, after school, like leveraging um, kind of time for adult uh, educational um, leaders to, to work with students to, to kind of walk them through the process. It could look like a number of strategies, but it would be predicated upon the needs that the LEAs have. So it wouldn't be us telling them how they have to do it. It would be us issuing grants for them to do it in the way that made the most sense uh, for their community. Okay, so it's really maybe not an incentive system. It's merely a grant program to, com to increase the amount of FAFSA that's being completed. Yep. I, okay. I think that's different. And then the other question I had is, do we, just because students aren't filling out FAFSA and we're low, but that doesn't necessarily mean people aren't deliberately not filling out FAFSA too. There may be other reasons, including that they may already be um, setting money aside for kids college, or they're doing something else besides college. They're doing a tech or other type of a thing. Um, so do, do, while we may be low, I don't know that are we low in completion? And then once again, those that have completed FAFSA, are they are they actually completing college after a couple of years? Or is this something that do you know what I mean? Are we are we setting kids up to go somewhere? And then once they've been there for a couple of years, it really wasn't where they wanted to be in the first place. And then we end up with student debt or other things. And so, anyways. Yeah, the, 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 those are interesting questions that that Melanie, she just sent me a text, a message that says she's trying to get here as fast as she can, but she had another engagement. Um, so she can- I'm, be I'm here, I apologize. Oh, okay. <laughs> I'm, so, I'm so sorry for being late. Um, Hi, I'm Melanie. Melanie speaks to this? Yes, go ahead, Melanie. Great. Okay, thank you so much. Um, so I'm Melanie Heath. I am the Associate Commissioner at the Utah System of Higher Education for Student Affairs and Access. And if I'm understanding correctly, the question is, um, how will our students not completing because it isn't for them? Um, and I wanted to clarify that our technical colleges do accept Pell Grants in work study. And so the FAFSA is the gateway really for 
um, those types of aid from the federal government and the Department of Education that don't have to be paid back. And so Pell Grants um, are accepted at our technical colleges um, in addition to our um, degree granting institutions. So Nate, was there any other context that I should speak to? Uh, yeah, I think uh, Board Member Earl's question was with regards to completion rates connected to students that have engaged in FAFSA. Um, mm. Like, what is that right, Board Member Earl? Um, so I, yes. sorry. <laughs> um, so I think in our business case, we spoke to um, that if a student completes the FAFSA, they are exponentially more likely to not just go to college, but also complete. And again, when I say college, I mean anything from a technical college to a university. Um, so one of the main reasons that students aren't participating in post-secondary is because of affordability challenges. And the FAFSA is the gateway, not just to federal aid, such as Pell Grants, but also state aid. Um, all of our state scholarships do require FAFSA completion as well, as well as many institutional scholarships in the Utah system and elsewhere. So by not completing the FAFSA, um, and I'm, I'm sure Nate mentioned this, but we continue to be among either the lowest or the second lowest in the nation in FAFSA completion is in our state. And um, we're leaving millions of dollars on the table. That's free money for our students. Again, that's money that does not have to be paid back. So um, it does it does directly impact post secondary entry and completion rates as well. Member Earl, do you have a follow up on that? I think she stepped away. No, I don't. Oh, okay, thanks. Um, <clears throat> Member Hart had a question also. Um, I think for you, Ms. Heath, if that's okay. Um, so, you know, and I thought about it, anyone could have answered it, actually. Um, this, it, this request originated from Yushi or from our board or who, where did this, where did this originate? Our board a couple of years ago, um, we did have a request from Yushi to have FAFSA be a graduation requirement. And is, yes, and our board uh, didn't feel comfortable with that at the time and instead asked for an incentive program to be uh, sort of thought through and looked at. And so this okay. is back around now. So okay. I guess so it's coming from both, maybe. Okay. It just, the or origination details and the origination in the chart, I was just confused. But I, I'm i really struggling with moving this business case forward. I was the first person to go to college in my family. I relied on resources. I had to fill out a FAFSA. Um, I had to pay back money and there were no excusals or anything of the sort. So very recently I finished paying that back. I don't know how I feel about part K-12 participating in that, that whole mechanism. I'm not sure that FAFSA, I understand that people get confused or are confused, students are confused, but we have mechanisms, our counselors are, uh, college and career readiness or college and career planning systems all include conversations around this. Every counseling center in high school, the information is readily available. I just, in a time when we need to be very careful of how we are asking for and um, making business cases to our legislature, I'm not sure that this is actually, and thinking about whose lane is what, I'm not sure that it's the USBE K-12 system that needs to take this on. I, I just really, there are so many, I have a lot of um, concerns about this and I'm, I'm, I just wanted to, I guess, hear from our 
people, which I guess means uh, Mr. Ock, um, is our field talking about this? And are we, are we really feeling like the things that we are doing already are not effective? Yeah, board member Hart, the, um, this business case what was kind of a collaboration of stakeholder groups that, that both touch on uh, the Utah system of higher ed as well as our, uh, our kind of stakeholders. So that includes uh, the counseling community, that includes the early college community to some extent, um, okay. although this, this lives more with uh, the counseling community than it does um, okay. with early college coursework. And so uh, this is of interest to, um, to, to stakeholders within the K-12 space, in part because um, like one of the, the kind of focal points of setting students up for success in whatever uh, they decide to do from a career perspective uh, is to have this smooth transition from um, the public ed system into the, the higher ed system. And so... Um, I'm not sure if Bethany Marker is on, but she may be able to speak more uh, specifically to the 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 kind of um, specific, like the the counseling community's uh, take on this. I know uh, we just spoke at or uh, a um, counseling uh, like gathering uh, mm -hmm. a few weeks ago, and and there were a number of questions and. Uh, a lot of interest in the new FAFSA dashboard. People were really thankful for, for having that information because of their interest in um, increasing the rates within their community. So, so I don't have any kind of quantitative data, but um, from, from my experiences with that community, both uh, when we engaged them in conversation last time, as well as is just recently, there, there is uh, an interest and um, a hope that, that money like this can, can help bring all the systems together to be able to collaborate uh, effectively and, and fluently for, for student benefit. And, and I appreciate that answer. I'd just like to make sure that if this kind of thing does move forward, that we consider taking things away that aren't working um, for counselors in the space and not just adding more. And um, also really, really leaning on you, she, and making sure that that it's part of their recruiting and, and application procedures rather than a an expectation on the end of K-12. So just just some thoughts I had. Thank you. I appreciate your response. And I'll, I'll piggyback on that a little bit too, Member Hart, because it's probably what should be for everybody, but um, you know, Mark and Laura and I have recently met with, um, at the request of the governor's office, with the higher ed commissioners and um, board president to really take a look at what's happening with that transition between K-12 and higher ed. And really to, to try to sit down and say, are there ways to brainstorm and figure out the question of why we have 38% of our students not engaging in any post-secondary training, not trade and nothing academic, not college. And what is happening when we are when we have a third of our students that are not getting any skills post-secondary, then ultimately where does that land us? Um, where does that land them and their families? So I think we're truly trying to brainstorm this. This might be one way, and, and we'll probably be reaching out to you as board members to say, as we go to additional meetings with this group, what, what ideas do you have that we can take to the table? And, and hopefully higher ed is asking themselves the same thing. So we, as you say, it doesn't fall on all on our shoulders or all on their shoulders, but that we're partnering together. Um, I have a member Klein. Okay, so I have a, an, another comment, um, but just based on what you just said, did, did you say 38% are going on? Is that ever? 
going on or just correct in immediate years right after high school? If I understand the data that was presented to us, that 38% are not go are not getting any skills post-secondary. Okay, because I know in Utah we have a large portion of, of graduating seniors that end up going on missions for a couple of years. And, and I worry that, you know, this may affect, you know, if we, if we tighten these strings and make it so that everybody moves on seamlessly, that that's going to interfere with something that's a big part of our culture here. So, um, that's and a question, I'll try to find that out. Okay. And then, you know, I had a couple of thoughts on, on just the whole, um, incentive thing to, uh, for the FAFSA, um, to me, it, it sounds more like we're providing an incentive for schools to coerce students into filling out the FAFSA so that the school benefits and they're selling it as they're pitching it to the kids as though they're going to benefit. They're going to get this free money, which they'll get free money, but things you get for free aren't always worth what they cost because it, it, it is putting them on a path of dependency, government dependency. And so when we say that, you know, we're the second lowest um, in, in the country in filling out classes, I, I would flip that around and say, we are the second most, like we are teaching our kids to be free from government dependency. And we're, that makes it sound like we're doing pretty darn good because our kids don't feel a need to, um, lean on the government and become dependent on them, especially at such an early age when they're just getting started. Um, you know, if they can build self-sufficiency, that's, and, you know, self-reliance, that's what, that's really what we want. And, you know, college can help some do that. And, and, and it may not help others do that. Maybe they have another path to that, to self-sufficiency that doesn't require that. And so, the fact that we're trying to kind of engineer this and using money um, as, or an incentive, you know, a carrot instead of a stick, meaning we're not going to require it for graduation, but we're going to, we're going to do everything we can to, to uh, manipulate them into doing it by putting out these big carrots that, uh, you know, you, she's trying to incentivize it because, that money will ultimately end up with them and help their system and make them more money because they can get more kids coming to them and bringing all that government money, then they benefit from that, right? So um, I just, I, I'm really, really uncomfortable with, with this whole idea and, and I will not be supporting this. Thank you. Member Moss, are you in line or do you have a FAFSA? I'm in line, thank you. Okay, Member Strait, is that the same with you? Uh, yes and no. I mean, I, I am in line, but I wouldn't mind weighing in just a little bit on, on this. You know, part of the whole, whole struggle is when it comes to uh, giving students opportunity is once that culture of education gets embedded in their family and... <clears throat> Board member Hart mentioned first generation. I'm, I'm first generation too, but my my older brother set the, the path, and we knew how to do it, and it, it helped me a lot. But his his struggle was a little bit more. You know, providing opportunity for students. Sometimes these kids they don't they don't even, they don't know how to go about this. We've had FAFSA completion nights at our school, and the students come, parents can come, and they walk them through the process. Sometimes that's just, you know, giving them that, that, that foot up and, and helping them understand how it works and, and what's available. Uh, yeah, without getting into a philosophical discussion about self-sufficiency in that heck i i see how this helps kids i and yeah maybe i'm i don't think we're teaching the wrong lesson necessarily by by doing that Thank but you. i want to say something else too and that is 
we're bogging down on one one business case and it's taking up our time and really let's give as many business cases as we possibly can the chance to be ranked by the members if you think this is uh an attack on self-sufficiency then don't rate it up in the top 10 if you believe that it's it's valuable then then do but we need to start moving on because uh it's uh it's imperative we have as many opportunities and as many different business cases i think we're getting bogged down on the final result before okay. we're even voting and that's Thank where you. i'll end Thank you. Member Hutchings? Uh, I call previous question. Okay, if I don't see any more hands other than those that are in queue for cases. So if you want to withdraw that motion, we can vote on this one. I will happily do um, that. Thank you. Board Member Davis, I'm so sorry to interrupt, but I was wondering if we could recognize um, our Utah Board of Higher Education member, Scott Tyre, is on the line. Um, and I just wanted to make sure that y'all knew that he was present and um, in support of this business case too. Absolutely, thank you. Scott, did you have something quick to add to this conversation? You can't do that, Vice I Chair. Can't. It was called a question. Oh, and then she, you withdrew she withdrew that. She, she withdrew her motion. She did that because you said there was no more discussion. Oh, got it. Okay, Scott, we're glad you're here. We can't have you speak, but <laughs> thank you for thank you for coming. Um, okay, let's go ahead and um, we have a motion on the table that the board moves the draft business case for FAFSA be supported for the 2023 general session. I have to make a roll call vote. Um, it's been requested. I switch every other time on these front to bottom and bottom to front. So board member straight. Yes. Member Norton. Yes. Member Moss. Sorry, I was muted. No. Member uh, Lear? Yes. Member Hymas? No. Member Hutchings? Yes. Member Hart? No. Member Earl? No. Member Klein? No. Member Cannon? Yes. Member Belknap? No. I'm a yes. That motion fails. Okay, Member Belknap, do you want to do your second one? Yes, and I'll try not to take so much time this time. I'm, I'm okay with an up and down vote. I would like to move forward the dual immersion um, one through nine program growth. Okay, we, do we have a, we have a motion on the floor that the board moves the draft um, business case for dual immersion program growth be supported for the 2023 general session. Do we have a second? Yeah, second. Member Strait is a second. Um, Seeing no hands, those in favor say aye. Aye. We have to take it. Oh, vote. I have to roll call. We got to go. Um, Member Belknap? Yes. Um, let me switch here just a second. Member Cannon? Uh, I have a question. Do these votes uh, indicate a priority? No. These are just saying that we support the case and they'll be in the big list of choices that you can prioritize after this meeting when we're sent the list. All right, yes. Uh, Member Klein? <coughs> mm, no. Um, Member Earl? Yes. Member Hart? Member Hart? Sorry, yes. Member Hutchings? Yes. Member Hymas? Yes. 
Member Moss? Yes. Member Norton? Yes. Member Strait? Yes. That motion passes with Member Klein opposed. Did you, I'm sorry, Cindy, I, did you call my name and I didn't vote? Oh, I had you crossed out from not being here earlier. I will circle you also. And I'm a yes on that. Okay. Thank you. And I was a yes on the one before and I was there. So I don't know if that made a difference. Okay. Thank you. Not quite. You're one short. So. Okay. Thank it's you. It's hard. It's hard to get eight votes when you don't have a, a full board here. Uh, thank you. Let's go to member Norton who was waiting in queue for a um, business case motion. Yes, I have two business cases to bring forward. The first one is the school readiness grants. Is there two? There's a motion on the floor that the um, board moves the draft business case for school readiness grant grants be supported for the 2023 general session. Do I have a second? Second. Member Strait, second. Would you like to speak to your motion? Yes. Um, this has been funded in the past by state funds. Most recently, it was changed to federal funds. Um, this request is to bring it back to use state funds uh, just because of the extra uh, requirements that were placed upon the money when it was being federally funded. Uh, there is also an additional $2 million ask uh, to grow the program. There is um, about 80%, a little more than 80% of the LEAs that are using these um, early readiness programs have uh, um, made mention that they have a large number of families that would still like to get in and their children need some extra help um, prior to kindergarten. Okay, thank you. Um, seeing no other hands. I have I have a question or Remember, comment. Or Remember that, Earl? Yes. Um, so this is child care programs. We're funding mm -hmm. we're funding child care programs. It's not of, yeah, go ahead. It's not child care programs. It is, and, and that's what the federal government was trying to turn it into. This is um, child readiness for school is what the state wants to have it be. It is early learning um, programs to get kids ready for kindergarten. Okay, so- And I can see Jared Lizenby on here and- he could probably answer these questions better than I. Yes, if I may. Um, the school readiness grants are specifically for preschool slots uh, within programs. They are targeted towards um, eligible children. Um, and there's, in the previous legislation, there's the, the list of things that are qualifying for eligible. Um, this is not for childcare, but as was pointed out, the federal funding has basically required um, the LEAs to meet some child care requirements that has added to their burden and, you know, provided some challenge for them. But yes, this is preschool slots only. Okay. So at my hearing you say we want to fund this so that we can do it instead of the federal government and create our own. Um, may I answer that question? Yes. Okay, um, this, you know, these programs were state funded prior to COVID. Um, with the, the COVID special session legislation, some of the funding, the state funding was um, substituted with federal funding. And it's that substitution that has raised, you know, the challenges and burdens. Um, basically, this is proposing to move that back to state funding to remove those burdens from programs. Thank you, Member Klein. Uh, yes, yeah, so um, does this, is this um, program already fleshed out what it looks like as far as um, what they use to help get preschoolers ready for education? Is it in a preschool setting? Is it an at-home thing? Is it online, digital? Is there data collection? Is there connections with Department of Workforce Services? May I respond to that question? 
Yeah, if you could just give a brief understanding of what, what it's for. Yes, okay, so this is the School Readiness Grants Program. Um, it provides services to both LEAs and private providers. Um, they need to show that they are sufficient quality and the focus is on quality. Um, and then um, the programs um, request and receive funding to provide slots for eligible children to, to participate. So yes, it does LEAs and private providers. Superintendent. Sorry, was it digital? Oh, is there no, data collection is, and this is in-person preschool slots. So no, there's is there data collection involved? Um, there is the requirement that um, programs provide PEEP data for the, the beginning of the year and the end of the year. Um, programs are requested to, or required to do ongoing internal assessment, um, but the data that we receive is the PEEP assessment data from the beginning and end of the year. Thank and you. Is there connections with Department of Workforce Services? Um, yes, this is a, a program that we joint, jointly run with the Department of Workforce Services. Thank you. With the Office Thank of Child you. Care. Thank you, Superintendent Dixon. Uh, thank you, uh, Madam Chair. Uh, these are good questions Board Member Klein is asking. Just a reminder that this, and I'll double down on what Jared has already said, that this is an existing program that by um, statute, the board oversees the public part, DWS oversees the grants on the private part. So we do monitor the programs for quality. The PEEP data is used in, uh, in aggregate. So it's even though we have individual scores, we're looking at aggregate to improve programs. So um, this has been at play. It's basically trying to get the federal dollars out and state dollars back in and open up more seats because we do have waiting lists. And it's targeted at um, students who, who really need the extra services and families who want those extra services for their children. Thank you. Um Member Norton, your hand is still up. Is that from the original motion or did you want to speak? I did not want to speak. I do have another one when this is over with though. That's why I left it up. Um, seeing no other hands, we have a motion on the floor that the board move to uh, the draft business case for um, school readiness grants supported for the 2023 general session. Member Belknap? Yes. Member Cannon? Yes. Member Klein? No. Member Earl? No. Member Hart? Yes. Member Hutchings? Yes. Member Hymas? Yes. Member Lear? Yes. Member Moss? Yes. Member Norton? Yes. Member Strait? Yes. That passes with Member Earl and Klein opposed. Member um, Member Norton, I let Vice Chair Belknap do all of hers because only one other hand was up at the time, but right after you put yours up, we got several up. So I'm gonna have to start rotating now if that's okay. Okay. Um, Member Moss. Thank you. Um, I, I have a couple Vice Chair at the request of staff. One is new, one is an amendment. And I also have two minor amendments to um, cases passed earlier. What would be the best way to go? Should I do uh, Let's do the new line? one now. And then when we're yeah. done with the new ones, let's move to the amended cases. Okay. Or, or I can get back in line, whatever works. So I, I'd like to move that we support the Grow Your Own Teacher and School Counselor Pipeline Program. Um, something that Senator Milner has been working on. It was introduced two years ago. It's been... Uh, very successful, about 48% of LEAs applied for the grant. And so the request this time is to approve $7 million, which I understand would approve, would support, let me just get this right, in terms of the cohort. Um, I think this is another cohort for two years. Let's see, fund both cohorts simultaneously. 
And I can't recall who's got um, more detail from staff on this, but uh, Angie, I know, does. Okay, there's a motion on the floor that the board moves the draft business case for Grow Your, Grow Your Own to be supported for the 2023 general session. Do we have a second? Second. I didn't quite catch that, but did you get that? Signal? Norton. Norton. Thank you. Uh, I think the hands we have left still are in queue. Superintendent Dixon, your hand is still up. Do you have something to add? Uh, okay. Uh, those in favor? Oh, sorry. I'll call a roll call. Brent Strait? Yes. Member Norton? Yes. Member Moss? Yes. Member Lear? Member Lear? Yes, yes, yes. Thank you. Member Hymas? Yes. Member Hutchings? Yes. Member Hart? Yes. Member Earl? Yes. Member uh, Klein? No. Member Cannon? Yes. Member Belknap? Yes. Um, that passes unanimously minus the people absent and um, board member Klein opposed. Member Strake? I would like to go to Kristen first. Could, could I, did you want me to do the other one, Cindy? It, sorry, I thought, was the other one still in the new pile or is the other? All right, one? no, okay, so I'll get back in line for the amendments. Okay, gotcha. thank you. Um, member Norton? Yes, this next came by the request from our RISA coordinators. Um, it is the early learning coaches in rural schools. Okay. Second. Okay, there's a motion on the floor that the board moves the draft business case. Um, early learning coaches in rural schools be supported for the 2023 general session. Uh, would you like to speak to your motion, Amber Norton? Yes, please. Yes, please. Um, this has been funded in the past. They're asking for ongoing funding or funding at least for the next year. Obviously, they would prefer ongoing funding. Um, they have these highly qualified teachers, many of whom are already um, certified coaches. Some are still in the coaching program that they would like to continue to have serving um, in these uh, various schools. They use them quite flexibly depending on the LEA needs in that particular RISA. And I think if there's other questions, probably Jennifer Thronson could best answer what we're doing. I know they're working very collaboratively with teaching and learning. Thank you, Member Cannon. Are you in queue for a motion or do you have a comment on this? I'm in queue. Okay, I think all three hands are in queue unless someone speaks up right now. So uh, we have a motion on the floor. Uh, that the board moves the draft business case for early learning coaches in rural schools be supported for the 2023 general session. Member Belknap? Yes. Member Cannon? Yes. Uh, Member Klein? No. Member Earl? Yes. Um, Member Hart? Yes. Member Hutchings? Yes. Member Hymas? Yes. Member Lear? Yes. Member Moss? Yes. Member Norton? Yes. Member Strait? Yes. That passes unanimously minus the people absent and board member Klein opposed. Member Strait? Yes, I have two. I know I'll need, just do one at a time, but uh, I'd like to go to the curricular, co-curricular uh, business case. There we go. So I move that we uh, approve uh, to move on to the next round to reduce curricular and co-curricular fees. Uh, there is a price tag on here. I imagine that how we approach this or uh, would would change. Uh, 
it was lots of positive uh, uh, action by the legislature last year, but in the end, the funding became the issue. So without getting into a long discussion on the funding, I say we approve this as it is right now uh, to move on for ranking and uh, work out all other details after that. Can I can just I ask, ask a clarifying question? I think that all of these in green, haven't we already moved to support? That's what I was gonna ask. I wondered what the green was, point of clarification oh, yeah. question. You're, I, I guess I wasn't aware of that. It's just ongoing from the previous year then. No, we took action on our first meeting, our first budget meeting. We took action on all of these in green and moved that the board would support these. Why don't I remember that? Okay. Sorry about that. Do you have your other one? Yes, I do. So this is a new business case uh, on school uh, capital improvements. Uh, let's see. Yes, there we go. Move that the board approve a new business case totaling 250 million in economic stabilization funds to support capital costs and technology. Uh, this, is, this is new to us, but it's not new. Uh, funding was put aside last year. Need um, a second. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. We have a motion on the floor that the board moves the draft business case for capital improvements um, be supported for the 2023 general session. Do we have a second? Second. Okay, Go ahead. thank you. Yeah. Would you like I, to speak to your motion, Member Street? Yes, I apologize. I was getting anxious. All right, so uh, we already have a business case for $100 million regarding school safety. Uh, there. There are proposals out there for this 250 million and some of those uh, include uh, safety as well. I would like to separate it out. Uh, it may be that we combine this later uh, as we work through and we, we align ourselves with uh, other education uh, entities. And, uh, but I'd like to support this as a base start as a new business case so that we're at the table in regards to these discussions. Thank you. Okay, uh, Member Hart, are you in queue or do you have a question? Okay, Member Hart. I'm I'm just kind of choking over 250 million. Is that a typo? No, okay, so that, no, it's not. This would be one-time money. I did not mention that, but thank you for the question. Yeah, okay. Member Moss. Sorry, I had to raise a physical hand too. Do we have a detailed breakdown for, for this proposal? I know that JLC is interested in it, but I, I don't know if I've seen that, where exactly that number came from. There is no breakdown. It's just a number. It was a number. It's uh, very similar to last year's number. In fact, Got I it. think it is the same. But they, yeah, it has some... It's not, this isn't exactly what JLC has, and it, but it gets us, uh, but we also have board member Hanson, which his, uh, his 100 million sa uh, school safety uh, business plan is, is already in the green. And so this, this kind of crosses with that. That's why I took uh, safety out of this, this one, but so we're not 100% committed to the 250 million, but that's that's a spot. And of course, it's one-time money. Uh, that's a whole different discussion. Uh, um, do, are you suggesting that then that we spend or, or support 350 million in capital costs between safety and these other needs? Like I, I do know that a lot of our growing districts and rural districts have said they need capital for full day K, but um, are you suggesting 350 or are you saying that suggesting 150 so that potentially they could combine later our safety and the capital? That, that's what I'm saying. Let's let's get this on 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 board and and then see where it goes from there. At 150. Uh, no, let's do let's do the 250. And I mean that number 
can obviously change. So d the total we have would be 350. I mean, I, I don't, I'm not all uh, caught up in that, that number, but if, if it would, if you'd support it, if with a, a, a 150 and then 100 for safety, if you wanted to split them, that's fine. I think in the end, it all comes together and, and everyone kind of works out how that would, that would uh, look. So anyway. Well, I, I'd feel better about that, but I'm not, I can't make the motions. Member um, Earl was, thanks for waving your hand. It helps to know if you're in queue or if you've got this one. So um, go ahead, Member Earl. Yeah, I think the legislature will probably do capital improvements, but I, I kind of am also concerned about the, we've already asked or put forward the 100 and then we're asking 250 and I, I know this is wish listy, so that's where I'm wondering what's the appropriate amount. Um, I, I do think it's appropriate probably to have some capital improvement funding. 250, I'm having a hard time swallowing it with every everything else and inflation and everything as far as um, putting money on D WPU versus, I, I don't know. So it's that balance, whether or not this money, this number amount or just moving forward something about capital improvements, I guess is my thought. Thank you. Vice Chair Belknap. Um, Chair, I'm actually looking for process here a little bit. This is the new business case that we don't have a business case for. Is that actual? We don't have the details for it. Correct. And, and well, you have only the details that are on the board. Okay. And this was brought forward not in July. Well, so this, I part, I borrowed this from the JLC priorities list, but that's that's what they're looking after, trying to kind of, kind of be on top of uh, moving things forward. Uh, yeah, I mean, that co-curricular fees and curricular fees kind of started the same way for us. It, it came from the came from the field, came through uh, JLC and anyway. No, I don't have a problem with that. I'm just, yeah. it's, this is a new business case. It's not one that we've reviewed. That's right. what I was trying to get clarity on. So we, okay. could, we could amend this. I mean, I would be definitely open to that. Uh, could we, could we add safety back in, which would include uh, what's already been put forward by the board for one-time money in our last last meeting? I, I I took the safety out because I wanted to respect what what uh, Member Hansen had put forward, and uh, oh. but that would that would bring it more in alignment. You you put. You can do it. How, how do you want? How do you want to do it? You could adjust, you know, the descriptors, or you could reduce this by a hundred million, which would essentially, I guess, do the same thing: keep a hundred million for safety, and then one hundred and fifty for other capital needs. You know what? That would be great. If are, we are you making before, that motion? Yes, I I move that we amend to one hundred and fifty million. Okay. Yeah. Uh, is there, we have a motion on the floor to amend this business case to 150 million. Do we have a second? Second. Okay, thank you. Um, Member Moss, I think you're still in queue. So those in favor on the amendment to reduce this request to 150 million. Um, I don't to get my voting paper back up. A member straight? Yes. Member Norton? Member Norton. On mute. Yes. Member Moss. Yes. Member Lear. Yes. Member Hymas. Yes. Member Hutchings. Yes. Member Hart. Yes. Member Earl. Yes. 
Member Klein. This is just for the amendment, correct? Brett. Yes. Member Cannon. Yes. Member Belknap. Yes. Now we have a business case on the floor uh, that the board moves the draft business case for capital improvements be supported for the 2023 as amended be supported for the 2023 general session. Um, Member Belknap. No. Member Cannon. No. Member Klein? No. Member Earl? No. Member Hart? No. Member um, Hutchings? No. Member Hymas? Yes. Member Lear? Yes. Member Moss? No. Member Norton? Yes. Member Strait? Yes. And I'm a yes, the motion fails. Um, Member Moss. Thank you, and I'll lower my hand. So I have, I have three amendments, very brief. One of them adds a million and a half, the other reduces a million and a half, so. Revenue neutral. One is to amend the USBE market adjustments business case, which initially was approved in the amount of $5,764,348 to $6,594,903, and to include in that a CTE administration allocation increase in the amount of $300,000. So to add to that 6.5 amount. Second. Thank you. We have a motion on the floor that the board moves the draft business case for market adjustments as amended. Can I do this, Sybil, in one motion or do we have to amend the amount first and then move the case? Uh, Vice Chair Davis, may I? Yes, yes, please. Um, I just amended because actually board member Moss added the amendment to his motion. So I, I changed okay. the motion as he went. So once you make this motion, you will have amended it and you will not need a second motion. It will be approved as amended, essentially, because it's already been approved and now you're just amending the approved amount. Thank you. I'm going to, going to read it again then because we already have a second by Mem Vice Chair Belknap. And the, so the motion on the floor is that the board amend the amount of $5,764,348 in the US BE market rate adjustment business case and adjust it to $6,894,903, including $300,000 for CTE administrative costs. Uh, would you like to speak to your motion, Member Moss? I think only if there are questions. I know staff are available, but I know for the general business case, or excuse me, for the market rate adjustment, there was additional review of the market and the prevailing rates outside of our agency. Um, as to the CTE portion, they have not been able to receive cost of living increases over the last few years. And so they added, asked that they be included in some of those adjustments. They're Funding is a bit more complicated because there are federal and state streams. I think Talia is here if there are more detailed questions about that one. Thank you. Member Earl, do you have a question on this? I think that answered my question maybe because I was trying to understand why it wouldn't have been added in already. But you're saying because of the complications of having it associated with both federal and state funding, it doesn't adequately provide for that. Am I understanding that right? That, that's my understanding. They have a, a supplement, not supplant rule, somewhat similar to SPED. And so that has resulted, as I understand it, in not receiving rate increases sufficient to keep up. I, I know Talia could go into more detail if she's here. I had the same question, but I, I like that we're rolling them together in one ask instead of two separate asks. Um, Member Hart? Nope, I'm just in line. Okay. Um, 
seeing no other hands, we have a motion on the floor. Um, Member Belknap. Yeah, I have a comment and then I'm in queue, but I would like to make a comment on this, that if we don't um, continually work to make our office viable, that that no one else is going to fight for finances or FTEs in our office. So I feel really strongly about this one. Thank you. Thank you. Um, we have a motion on the floor that the board moves to draft business case for market adjustment as amended be supported for the 2023 general session. Um, Member Strait? Yes. Member Norton? Yes. Member uh, Moss? Yes. Member Hymas? Yes. Member Lear? Yes. Member Hutchings? Yes. Member Hart? Yes. Member Earl? Yes. Member Klein? Um, I'm going to abstain. Um, member Cannon? Yes. Member Bel Vice Chair Belknap? Yes. This passes unanimously with those present with board member uh, Klein abstaining. Um, okay. Now you may have to help me. Was it, I don't know who's in queue for, member Klein, are you in queue for a business case? No. Okay, member, um, I don't remember who was first. Member Hart? Um, it is to amend a business case that's already moved forward. Is this the appropriate time? Uh, yes, seeing no other hands that are bringing forward the 13 business cases that had not been discussed. Um, okay. And okay. I actually think, can I add, Member Moss, uh, were you going to make a collective motion on that or do we want to go for these individually? <laughs> Um, sorry, on, on the two, on the market rate adjustments? No, on the amended business cases. Okay. Um, I just have one more and it's, th that was an amendment. The, I have one other on an amended and I can hold them. Okay. okay. If, if you're, if, if someone is going to make a collective move to move forward the amended cases, let's take that motion first. If not. I'll attempt it. I'll, I'll attempt it. I don't know if somebody will divide it, but okay. I'll try. Okay. I move that we approve the amended business cases, uh, family engagement specialist, teacher leader mentoring, BTS, educator licensing, uh, forward to the, I know that, uh, help me. Uh, be be supported for the 2023 general session. Be supported for the 2020 20, the 2023 legislative session. Thank you. Do we have a second? Second. Board Member Cannon. Okay. Thank you. Um, would you like to speak to your motion? Uh, yeah. All of the information on the. Um, changes is in backups, so that was previously available and available to the public. Uh, several of these, if not all of them, were adjusted based on collaborative efforts with board members, RISA directors, other stakeholders, and in at least a few cases, we were able to uh, dial down the uh, fiscal requests, and I, um, upon review, they look... Um, they look stronger than they looked the first time. So um, I'm ready to move them forward. Okay, thank you. Vice Chair Belknap, do you have a comment on this? Just in queue, member Earl? Yeah, there's two motions on the Beverly Taylor Sorensen. The second motion ah. prioritizes it above something else, but it seems to me like we, we really can't do that if eventually we're going to be actually as a board prioritizing. So it kind of throws that mechanism off. Um, if it's appropriate for an amendment, I move that the second motion be removed. Yes, and my motions were only for the amendments, not for the part. Oh, okay, okay. 
Okay. Thank you. Then I won't need to do that. So I so, was wondering so if that was member a Hart. Oh, sorry, yeah. Sorry, member Earl. I didn't mean to cut you off. That's all right. Go ahead. Um, so member Earl, your motion included everything except the second BTS motion. Yes, because only the amendment. Okay. The, the Just first the one had the verb amend. Correct. And the second one had the verb prioritize, uh, and I only want to amend. Okay, sorry. I appreciate that. No, I needed to clarify. Thank you. Do we have discussion to the motion? Let me just scroll a little bit so we can see all four. Thank you. I'll give you a second to look at that again. And I'll scroll up a little bit more. So we can see the whole thing. Thanks. Member Lear. Thank you. <laughs> I couldn't find my button. I and I came late to the party. So did any of the amounts change on those four? Yes. And Molly's nodding. Can somebody quickly tell me what those amounts now are? Sure. I can speak first to the um to the uh licensing. Um there was uh, uh, there was a request uh, for um, assisting with the coursework for the educator competencies. Um, that request was uh, significant. I, I believe it was nine mil. It was it was well, several million millions, and it dropped to two uh, two point four. Um, the However, that was offset by a um, very well-reasoned request uh, that we help candidates with the cost, defray the cost of the competency-based assessment, which um, uh, would cost 1.3. So it dropped from, well, uh, Chair, did you say it was 9 million? It was over 10 originally. Yeah. So. Well, and that part dropped to 2.4, but then we added 1.3. So a net, the net amount goes to, uh, this might be phone a friend from the Whoa. staff. Yeah, and I was referring to the total cost of the original. Yeah, yeah. Like okay, it here, nine it, here it is. The total funding request would go from over 9 million to 6.495. Okay. And, uh, one, three is one time and uh, uh, of that, 1.3, one time. Okay, and BTS, anybody can speak to that change amount? This is Kathy Jensen. Uh -huh. Go ahead, Kathy. Uh, there is no change to the amount. There is just change to the language. Right. Uh, changing the... Uh, for FTE to a up to 3% of the total allocation and uh, then no change to the total amount. Thank you. Thank and you, then, Dr. Jensen. And then there are two more there. And I, I should, and I- You already I, discussed the amounts on the market rate adjustments. No, and then the two above that though, the two above BTS. Um, Member Moss, do you want to address those? Yeah, there's no change on the amount to family engagement. It was just some clarity and changing of purpose that this person could help reach out and support and train LEAs if they requested. Uh, the second one on teacher leadership, that's the one where we dropped it from 3.5 to 2.4. Okay. So the original business case had four elements. Those were combined, streamlined, and the amount reduced by about a million dollars. Thank you for indulging me. I appreciate that. I can vote more intelligently. Thanks. Thank you. Member Klein. Uh, yes, I just wanted to make a motion to divide the first two from the last two. There is a motion to divide the first two from the last two. Do we have a uh, second? I'll second it. Member Earl, second. Did you want to speak to your motion, Member Klein? No. Okay, there's a motion on the table to divide the first two from the last two. Member Strait. 
please vote. Sorry, what was that? Um, no. Member Norton? No. Member Moss? Uh, yes. Member Lear? No. Member Hymas? No. Member Hutchings? Member Hutchings? No. Member Hart? No. Member Earl? Wait, that wasn't me. <laughs> oh, I think we got two from maybe Member Hutchings. Oh, okay. Uh, okay. Yes. Member Earl? Yes. Member Klein? Yes. Member Cannon? No. Member Belknap? Yes. That fails. That motion fails. So we have a motion on the table to uh, that the board moves the amended draft business cases forward for family engagement specialist, teacher leader mentoring, Beverly Taylor Sorensen, and oh, scroll up for a minute. What was the one on the bottom? Licensing. And, and Licensing. Educate. Davis, yeah. there is a motion that has them all in it um, right there next to board member Hart. Okay. There is a, a motion on the floor that the board amend the business cases on family engagement specialist, teacher leader mentoring, BTS, and educator licensing as described in backup, and that each amended business case be supported for the 2023 general session. Um, there's, I'm running out of squares on my votes. Member Bell. Vice Chair Belknap. Yes. Member Klein. No. Member Cannon. Yes. Member Earl. Yes. Member Hart. Yes. Member Hutchings. Yes. Member Hymas. Yes. Member Moss. Yes. Member Norton. Yes. Member Lear. Yes. Uh, Member Strait. Yes. That motion passes unanimously with Member Klein opposed. And um, members, it's we're five minutes ahead of schedule to move into our WPU discussion. So, uh, Let's talk about WPU. Oh, no, 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 no. Who's no, no, no? Me. Who's saying no, no, no? Uh, Belknap, I'm still in queue. You, I apologize. Are you in queue for one of the amended? Yes. Okay, go ahead. Sorry. Okay, I'm going to need Angie to help me because I'm doing this on the fly, which is not how we did it, but I'm trying to support board members straight. I'd like to go back to the safety and capital. Um business case and add in thank you who's ever driving here and add in 75 million dollars for capital can somebody find that and and put that in there Okay, there's a motion on the floor that the board approve a new business case totaling 75 million in one-time economic stabilization funds to support capital costs and technology. Do we have a second? Second. Okay, member straight second. Um, member Belknap, would you like to speak to your motion? I'll be quick. I just think that we're going to need this for, especially with the kindergarten and other items that um, our schools need for capital. Thanks. Thank you. Um, member Lear. You're muted. Member Hart. Yeah, I, I'm, so this is not the business case, school safety, physical facilities, capital needs, correct? Correct. 
And we don't have any business case in front of us for this. So we're simply going off this title. We have a business case for 100 million for safety capital improvements, but we don't have anything for the capital improvements. For example, the full day K rooms and things of that nature. This is what member Belknap is asking to add in for 75 million. And, and I may or may not disagree that this may be needed, but I can't vote for something that I haven't seen a business case on. So I just wanted to explain that. If it was one of the green ones that I could go back and review, then that's fine. But I can't, I can't vote for just an amount and a theory. So I, I just wanted that on the record. Okay. Thank you, Member Earl. And I guess it goes along that same lines that we've got capital and technology built into this and knowing where that's, where that's going. And so we're, are we, we are amending the school safety, physical no. facilities, capital needs. No, no. Yeah, are, we are. Are we yes. Yeah. I wanted to add school safety, physical capital needs and physical needs uh, uh, capital. And I didn't include the term technology in my amendment. Okay, wait, Member Belknap, are you doing anything to the 100 million safety capital that we've already? No, I want to make an additional 75 million under capital needs in that same one. And you took technology out of your yes. motion? Yes. So we would, this would be solely for capital needs, the 75 yes. million. Yes. Okay, so, <laughs> so then, hmm. Because I had problems with the first one because the wording of it. So this would just this would be amending it, but not changing what the original one was, right? This would just adding two. Yes. No, just it is a separate case. So there's the 100 million for safety, and this is 75 million for capital needs. Okay. Uh, let's see, uh, member. Stallings, uh, Deputy Superintendent Stallings. Thank you. I um, guess I'm hearing two things. At one time, I've heard we're amending the school safety physical facilities capital needs business case that already exists to add 75 million. Is that true and maybe uh, broaden the uses or is it a new one? I apologize. It, it's the same one to broaden the uses for capital as well, but keeping um, the 150 million for anything. safety separate from the 75 million for capital. But it's in, gonna be in one ask? Yes. So legislature. point of order? That's going to be delineated for 100 million for safety and 75 for other capital needs. Is that correct, Vice Chair Belknap? Yes, thank you. That's helpful, thank you. Um, Member Hart. So I go back to that one and that's where the backup information is. Correct. So this, this now is an amendment to the business case that already exists. And it is amending it from 100 million to 175 million. And it's opening it up for capital needs for safety and other capital needs as has been expressed by the LEAs. Thank and you. delineated in there. The difference. I now understand. Uh, for, for now. Thank you. Member Strait. I, I would like to add that last year when we did the business case for uh, curriculum and co-curricular fees, that we actually took uh, the data that had been put together in response to the, the LEAs and, uh, and their priorities. Uh, this is, in my view, a little bit the same, except we don't have as solid in numbers because uh, there was no, there was lots of study, there's lots of pre-work that was put into that before I even put that business case together. So all the information was there. Uh, I mean, that I think this gets us in a place where we can then work through these issues because, for example, when it comes to school safety, that's that's really 
a major part of the emphasis of this, but there are other capital needs. And uh, what that exactly looks like, can't tell you, but it'd be nice to be in the building with everyone else who will be discussing this and has it as part of their agenda and their objectives. Anyway, hopefully I didn't say too much. Well, so if I remember correctly last year, I think there was a 250 million request, but I think the legislature did a 90 million, uh, but it was quite broad, similar to this, and it had opportunities for safety or other capital needs so that the LEA who perhaps had done more in safety could use it, the capital to uh, create full day cake classrooms and vice versa or or another capital need. Um, Member Hart, no, no, Member Earl. So the original safety one was based on us doing, going in, uh, so I'm trying to understand, us going in, asking for information, and then us kind of saying which ones we, we wanted. I'm not, it, is this, is the same process happening with the physical facilities kind of a thing? That's what I didn't like about the safety. We were directing it and telling them what needed to happen kind of a thing. I, I'm not wanting that to take place. And maybe that's not what um, board member Belknap is intending. I just wanna make sure that's not what this looks like. Mitch, Vice Chair Belknap. Yeah, we're not telling them what they have to do with this money. It just has to be in capital. And last year when we did this investigation, they really were, they needed about $110 million um, for capital. We received some, but we need additional to finish up our capital projects. Well, it was the increased costs. Yeah, and what it's not last year's, it's actually the school safety thing that I have an issue with connecting at that because we are doing, according to the way it was written, it was us that are going to go in and assess and tell them what to do. And I have a problem with that. This is disconnected from that. Am I right? It, yes, and we can make that clear. Okay. It's I in want the same ask, but the asks within the asks are delineated. So the process for the safety is different from the process for the 75 million capital. Okay. I just want to be clear on that because I don't, I didn't vote for the original safety because of that mechanism, not because we didn't need it. So, so this would be an amend an, an amended case, an amendment to that case. Uh, Angie, do you have a? Can I can I read this now? And then let's vote and move on to WPU. Yes. Um, uh, there's a motion on the floor that the board amends the school safety physical capital needs business case to increase the funding request by 70 million one time, 75 million one time, 175 million total in economic stabilization funds to add general capital costs as an allowable use of the funds for the additional 75 million and to change the title to physical facilities capital needs supports the amended business case for the 2023 general session. Um, Member Strait? Yes. Member Norton? Member Norton? Try to get on again. Yes. Member Moss? Yes. Member Lear? Yes. Member Hymas? Member Hymas? Member Hutchings? Yes. Member Hart? Yes. Member Earl? Yes. Member Klein? Yes. Member Cannon? Yes. Member Belknap? Yes. Or Vice Chair Belknap? I'm going to circle back to Member Hymas. We did not get a vote from him. Are you I on? I don't see him on here anymore. Did he have to leave? Maybe. Okay, so we'll need to add him to the absent list. Um, executive director child. Um, and that passes unanimously.
So we're now moving into our um, discussion on WPU and I'll entertain motions if anyone has any. No one wants to take a shot at what an ask for a WPU would be. Member straight, your hands up. Member straight, you are muted. Sorry. So I'll just throw this out there. Uh, let's start with 10% uh, uh, WPU. I know in, in, in my experience, my experience that that's that was the minimum in uh, determining uh, in our in our local uh, city what needed to happen, and that's that's about where we were at. I think that's a good starting point. Uh, we need to attract educators. We need to uh, support support staff. Uh, I think as part of our our general uh, need to. Uh, incentivize uh, going into education. We have a large COLA, cost of living. Uh, I know the formula is the average over three years currently in place, which would not be 10%, but it'd be close to just a one year average. But uh, yeah, we need to, and I think that's the minimum. Okay, we have a motion on the floor that the board uh, amend the business case on the WPU to be a 10% WPU increase. Uh, do we have a second? Yes, Norton. Okay, second, Norton. Member Strait, uh, you spoke a little bit already to your case. Did you want to speak again? No, everyone else needs a turn. All right, I have three hands and I, I'm not sure which came up first. So forgive me if I take you out of order. I'm gonna just go with who's on my screen on the top to bottom, it, Vice Chair Belknap. That actually is the order, Vice Chair. Oh, okay. Just so you know when they come up. I have two clarifying questions. One, are you talking 10% increase plus the 2.5 that's an, an automatic part plus part of the stabilization. Well, my intent is it be inclusive at this point, but I this I am not absolutely sold on this number, and uh, I just don't want it to be less. <laughs> but it's part of everyone should should uh, do their their own uh, thoughts on it, and then okay. Um, my second clarifying question, Vice Chair, is um, I don't know if uh, Deputy Superintendent Scott Jones is on, but I'd like to know what the total amount of money is for a 10% WPU increase. And, and then we've also seen what our totals are of the, our requests, not including this, and we can ask for it all, but we can't get it all. And so may I have that approximate amount for a 10% increase. Chair. Madam Chair. Yes, please. So Deputy please. Superintendent Jones, so for planning purposes, uh, a 1% increase to the WPU would be approximately 40 million this year. 40 million is probably a little too high, um, but, okay. but for planning purposes, 1%, so a 10% increase would be at this point in the process around 400 million. And then if I may, Madam Chair, just maybe some technical wording on the motion. What you're seeking is a 10% is a increase to the value of the WPU. Okay. Um, and then I just think we're going to consider that a, a clerical <laughs> amendment. I mean, a clerical fix. We're not going to vote on that. It's fine. Thank you. Okay. Thanks, and can I ask one more question, Chair? Yes. I'm not to ask too big a question. 
Um, Scott, what's the largest amount that we have received in the time you've been at our in our office for the bottom line? Do you know? For the sum total of public yes. education dollars just ongoing for, for state money ongoing. Yep. Uh, I was approximately 600 million now. Okay. I just wanted to give our board members a look at what we're we're looking at. If we take 400 million of that, which our biggest was 600 million, that gives us 200K to, to work with in ongoing. So thank you. And, and I had asked this last week, but maybe it would be good at some point to put up how much we've approved so far and ongoing. So people get in and uh, know that as well. Um, member, uh, gosh, who's next? I thought it was Moss maybe, Member Moss. It's board member Lear. Or member Lear. Either way, I'm fine. I just have a question also. I was trying to find the um, email from Lexi Cunningham, and I, I if memory serves, USBA also asked for a 10% increase in the WPU. Is someone, can someone confirm or deny? It's accurate. Do you know if it included the uh, stabilization? I don't. Madam no. Chair. It included the- Madam Chair. Yes, please. This is Scott. Up. Yeah, the 10% increase that they are asking for is inclusive of the inflationary adjustment mm -hmm. uh, that results from HB 357 slash Amendment G. What we're estimating right now is that, now this is subject to the process, is inflation will come in around 3.5%. So then if you wanted to land on 10%, that would be 6.5%. Does that make sense? So um, we don't know that quite yet what that final, final inflation number is. But by way of my understanding of your motion, you're seeking the 10% to be inclusive of whatever inflationary rate adjustment there is, uh, you know, plus to get to the 10%. Does that make sense? So right now we're estimating somewhere around 3.5%. So then that would be an additional 6.5%. And Deputy Jones, I just want to clarify that when you say 2.5 or 3.5, whatever comes out, you're talking about the formula in the law that says they yes. have to use the last so many years average. You're not talking about what the actual inflation rate is right. per se right now. Yeah, wherever we land on that just, inflationary percentage, Madam Chair, yes. is by way of the to your point, the formula that was, or the calculation, or the use of the data um, that is that that was agreed to as part of this process. Yeah, it's not like last year's inflationary rate. It's it's a which would be much higher. It's a, it's a product, yes, ma'am. Correct. Just want to make sure we keep that in mind as we're having this conversation, so people know what we mean when we say the inflationary rate. It's not status quo, it's formulaic in the code from past years. Yeah, okay. basic, basically, ma'am, in technical terms, it's a five-year average of what's called the CPI, the Consumer Price Index. So it's a five-year, um, I mean, I can double check that with Ben, but I'm pretty sure it's a five-year of the CPI. It is, there is a uh, some advocates right. who are trying to reduce that to I um, think three years, but I don't think that was successful. Right. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Yeah. So, Member Hart, I had a brief follow up. Follow up. Um, was anybody? Uh, can anybody tell me in a, just a short statement if what the rationale was from the SBA who may have talked to the folks, if that they're willing to forego things or why that was that seems high. Um, I think that they should probably speak for themselves. I I believe that uh, Director Cunningham said she was on this meeting. Is that the case? I didn't see your name. I thought she said she would be available during the meeting if anyone had questions. No, it's your name. In an email or something. Uh, there was an email that I just... Okay. Does someone try to want to speak for her? that has talked to her, I have not spoken with her personally. Or was in the meeting? Never mind. If there isn't, don't belabor it. Thank you. Okay, Member Hart. Hi. 
I'm all for as much money for education as, as, and I think we're underfunded. I, I have two concerns. One is 10%. I remember distinctly my very first official board meeting, or maybe it was the second being laughed out of town because somebody asked a legislator asked how much we were going to need to recover from the pandemic. Now, interestingly, that's how much ESSER money we got, and we used every bit of it um, and could have used more. So there's that. But I just, I really am sensitive to the fact that 10% is, quite frankly, um, a breathtaking amount. And, but then when you put it in context of, inclusive of those other things. Why couldn't we state it as a WPU plus blah, blah, blah? Because one way, certainly, I realize it's the same thing, but it just, I don't know. That's one thought I had. The second is, do we do this now? It doesn't, I'm wondering if this just seems a bit early. I, I, I'm concerned that I don't know. I, those are two thoughts I had and I'm, I'm struggling with that. Um, uh, and answer, so I don't know how I would vote. To answer that process question, member Hart, um, we usually in the past have included the WP request in the mm -hmm. priority list. Oh. I mean, I personally have always thought they should be separate there should be a wpu ask and then a priority yeah. list i don't know how the rest of the board members feel or if someone wants to make a motion that the wpu conversation um be postponed to october but i think deputy superintendent jones correct me if i'm wrong it, it is part of the law require us just to give a prioritized list to the governor or also to include whatever amount we are going to be asking for the WPU or is that sort of just understood? And do we have flexibility if we don't wanna have that WPU conversation today? Do we have that luxury? Um, well, so, you know, to meet the, to, the, to meet the letter of the law and the intent of the law to provide the governor your recommendations for the budget for you know fiscal year 2024 what gets considered by him and his you know in the next legislative session um every year i've been here we've always been in, have included a recommended uh percentage increase to the value of the wpu as part of that package i mean you know to answer your question ma'am you could wait until october uh, there's nothing that specifically stipulates that you have to provide that number um, as part of the overall process, but we would really need it to, you know, fill out the budget prep process and do all those types of uh, items. So, I mean, every year I've been here, we've always had at least some indication of the board's intent or recommendation on, if you will, uh, or request for a increase to the value of the WPU as part of the overall package that you submit uh, in accordance with the Budgetary Procedures Act to the governor's office. So, so if you yeah. could do it on October, the first weekend in October when we have board meetings, but right. it wouldn't be included in a, in a rank order list as one of the 12 options, it would be a separate piece because we would have already done the rank order lists. Uh, sounds like I, I see the wheels. Well, turning I have a, vice chair I have a, but I have a follow up. Heart. Yeah. I, and I appreciate that information, uh, Deputy Jones. I just, it seems somewhat insensitive to put out a request without having some more information about what's coming um the state's way it's kind of like saying no matter what the situation is this is what we want period and and i understand and so that was just something i wanted details on i i do think that we can prioritize wpu without having the amount we still know that where where that fits in our prioritization but i don't have enough experience to to really feel strongly about waiting or or not i just it just i needed more information because it didn't 
seem intuitively um, like it made complete sense. So thank you. Thank you. None of it ever does because we're doing this without revenue and we have to. But I did see an article that the Utah Taxpayer Association came out with projections, revenue projections. Deputy Superintendent Jones, is that purely speculative or do we have any understanding of what could be available for funds this year? Well, there's certainly some indications of amounts. Um, we, we, we don't have a specific amount yet. That comes out by way of the Executive Appropriations Committee process, which is later in the fall, right? So we don't, what we're here, here is, yes, there's a surplus. We hear terms like there's a lot of one-time money, uh, but the, the specific amount is not really made available to us until after... That, that is part of the challenge here, right, is by the law, we have to package this and make a proposal to the to the governor to include his budget without really knowing for certain how much money we have to work with. That typically comes out again later in the fall, as does the amount of the inflationary or the inflationary amount that typically comes out towards the end of October, right? So again, right now we're looking closely that it looks like it'll be around 3.5% but it won't be final until um, well after that timeline that you hit to put into your thing. So if you want to land on, you know, 10%, you know, the wording that you have right now is sufficient, right? 10%, which is, which is inclusive of whatever amount is finalized within it. So if it ends up being, you know, 3.2%, then we would add on the percentage to get to 10 or, you know, that I, I think that's pretty, pretty reasonable, right? I think everyone understands that, that it's a timing and that because of the timing of the requirement for you to submit to the governor's office, there's still just not a lot of information that's available. And so that's typically why uh, in the past, the decision has been, you know, give a preliminary or, you know, number of what, of what percentage in the value of an increase to the WPU you want, and then as more information comes available, you can always adjust, right? Yeah. Or, or see what happens. So yeah. it's just, yeah, it's just, Thank you. It's just I, I've never seen it where, you, where uh, um, okay, so this is my seventh year. I've never seen it where the board would put forward, well, yes, we want a WPU value increase, but no percentage on there. Not saying you can't do that, but, you know, I mean, in the past, we've always landed on it, at least one initial value you know, to put into the proposal. And then it also offers you an opportunity to consider it against the other requests when you do your prioritization exercise between this meeting and the October meeting. Okay. So, yeah. yeah, I'm gonna move to the other hands now. Thank you, I just, I was That's wondering right. if this is what yep. LEAs thought they needed to stay status quo with the current inflation realities or if this was going to be able to propel I, I, that's a question we would have to ask them, though, if anyone has talked to them or knows that, that'd be great. Member Moss. Uh, thanks. Quick question and potentially a motion. When exactly in October do we need to get this to the governor? We have a board meeting the first week of October. Yep. Uh, Madam Chair, if I may. Yes. Typically, the, the governor's office, they're very good about this. Um, they understand your timeline. So typically, they give us one week or somewhere around five business days after your October meeting to put the package up to them. So th there's no there's no room for another meeting or something like that, right? I mean, I mean they're being very reasonable in the sense that they even give us, uh, you know, your October meeting because typically they've been due right before your meeting, or you know, like their different um, agencies will have submitted their packets even before you meet in October. Uh, we've we've been given a lot of support from them to be given that additional week after you meet in October to submit the package to them. Does that answer the question, Madam Chair? Yeah, Jennifer? thank you. I mean, based on that, I, I'd like to bring a motion to uh, delay the actual vote on this amount until our October study session so we can take the discussion to date and then review additional information, both from the field and from um, projections on revenue. Thank you. There's a motion on the floor to um, delay this discussion to the October board meeting. 
do we have a second? Second. I think I need to I think I need to say it a little differently to to postpone this agenda item to the October board meeting. Um, we have a second, um, Member Belknap. Or actually, Member Moss, you talked a little bit already as to the why. Do you need to speak again? Well, just briefly, I think, you know, there, there are both political and financial considerations here. I think this has been a great introduction to what we're seeing out there and what we're thinking. But um, I think another month of evaluating both the specifics that we're hearing from the field and, again, projection would help us to make sure we don't overshoot with the legislature. But we go up with a, a broken down, you know, this amount in inflation and this amount from stabilization, uh, WPU increase. I think we would just have a more thoroughly formulated opportunity to arrive at that exact number rather than shooting it up there now and then having to maybe revisit as we go forward. That that feels to me like a, a more um, thoughtfully considered and more likely to be accepted approach. Thank you, Member Belknap. Yeah, I'd like to make a substitute motion. Okay. That it's the one up there, the optional one um, for a 6.5. Okay, we have a substitute motion on the table that the, um, can you scroll up <laughs> or down? <laughs> Sorry. We have a substitute motion that the board amends the WPU value increase business case to be a 6.5 increase to the value of the WPU above the amount automatically included in the base budget as described in Utah code and supports the amended business case for the 2023 general session. We have a second. I'll second that. Okay, member straight second. Would you like to speak to your motion, member Belknap? I would, and the reason I brought this forward is we are not going to know any additional revenue numbers. We're not going to know any new specifics by the time we meet in October. So choosing this now, and then we can readjust it in November. We can readjust it. And how can we prioritize what we believe are our top 10 priorities if we don't have some idea of what is already going to be, quote unquote, taken off the top with the WPU? I think it puts us in a conundrum to prioritize, which we have to do this month to be ready for our October meeting. Thank you. Um, Member Strait? Yes, I, you know, uh, 6.5 here, we have our, that doesn't include the, the automatic with the COLA or the inflation over five years. So it, it sixes to me. Uh, I, I would like to point out that we do know some things. And I just was doing some math. I started teaching in 1991, fresh out of Utah State, and quickly found out I had more money in college than I did <laughs> teaching. And uh, so I did some calculations based on what is suggested as far as if you're renting, they, they suggest that you're uh, not above 30% of your gross income before taxes. So I did the numbers on that. And if you're getting paid $50,000 a year and you work in my school, the school district I retired from, they, they suggest you don't go over $1,250 rent. We have a brand new apartment building that went up. A one bedroom apartment is $1,700 a month. And so as bad as I think I had it back in 1991, I absolutely did not have it as bad as our current crop of brand new teachers this year. And so they don't have the choices that I had. My wife was completing her, her, her uh, student teaching. Uh, we had a, a brand new baby and we were struggling at 550 a month when I add up how much it should the cost, $439 would be my equivalent rental. But look how our, our brand new educators are behind. Now, that's a problem over time. I'm just pointing out to the reality that over the last couple of years, we've had incredible, incredible 
prosperity in the state of Utah. And I love prosperity, but guess what? I've been in my home that I'm currently in for 13 years. I could not afford to purchase my home. That's what these young people are facing. And we talk about trying to, to maintain, uh, you know, 10% really isn't enough. Sounds horrible. Sounds like a lot of money. But the truth of the matter is that we are losing purchasing power. And it's not me that pays for that. Because I've been in my home for 13 years, but now it's doubled in value just in the last two. I can't afford, couldn't afford it. They can't either. And, uh, you know, we need to come to understand that. I will tell you that right now we have 800, we're a small city. We have 850 new housing units being built right this second. And the, the, the cost is not going down. Uh, but I can tell you that from the revenue side, we, are, we have more than a 10% increase in overall revenue for our sales tax. Now, that might be a little skewed because our portion of that, we have a lot of uh, grocery stores uh, that go beyond our, our normal, the normal uh, distribution and, and a Costco, which leads to that. But those are significant numbers. And... Uh, we, we, have, we have issues. Prosperity has been wonderful, but it's putting us further behind when it comes to education. We have to realize that. So I, I, I think I'm ahead of myself. I know we're going to discuss this more. I support the substitute motion. Uh, yeah, I think it looks a little different from that end. And we can talk about this next month, but I feel very passionate about this. And, uh, you know, I, Member Strait, really yeah, sorry, we're, we're past ending time. So if you could sum up, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> I'm done. Okay. Here we go. <laughs> uh, just just some, some quick final comments, and then we really need to end the meeting. Um, Member Earl. Yeah, I this whole process is so messy for me. It's it's Christmas, 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 and then <laughs> I I guess that's just the way it is, meaning that everybody put everything forward you want, and then we also want this large increase in teacher pay. I, I'm trying to figure out how to balance the, the whole thing out. Um, and it, I don't know, fiscally, it just, for, there's this stuff that I, I'm just not sure. And, and that's be, because I guess it's the, once again, it's the sky's the limit, but then really we know the sky's not the limit. And with, without that end result, it's hard fiscally for me to even wrap my head around all this, especially after we just voted please push all these things forward too. So anyway, I'm just, I guess I'm just voicing a little bit of maybe frustration or whatever, just kind of going, you know, I, I don't know. It's a messy process. And maybe that's just the, that's the reality of it. It's been that way the whole time. And then it doesn't even, in the end, I'm like, we get to January and I'm like, I don't know why we put all this effort and stuff in because everything got moved around anyways. But um, anyways. For sure. Amen, sister. Okay. Mr. Uh, Member Moss. Thanks. I'll be quick. And, and I second what Member Strait said. I, I you know, our, our educators need this. They deserve it. They are the future. Everything that, you know, we say about education is true. Um, it does run up against budget realities. And so my motion was intended to sort through some of the stuff that we just saw this week and, and keep looking at it. Am I, am I hearing though two things? Have we always done this in September? And if we do look at numbers, are we in a position to adjust that in connection with prioritizing all the other hundreds of millions of dollars that we've just put on our wish list? Uh, just process wise, I mean, we are going to bring the list to the board. You'll get a list sent to you of everything that has been supported. We'll do our prioritizing. We'll come back in October and then we'll seek a, a motion to support that list or send it to the governor's office. And so, you know, theoretically, Hopefully we don't have a lot of these, but if you had to make a tweak to the WP or something, I mean, theoretically that could happen. Um, no, the, why, you, someone correct me if I'm wrong. 
the WPU is not necessarily set in stone if we look at other things. Is that correct okay. now in January? That is my belief and understanding. Um, Deputy Superintendent Jones, and I probably is that a stressful answer because really a lot of work goes into trying to prep up plans and presentations and things like that. But technically we could make an adjustment if we had to. Somebody correct me if I'm wrong. No, that, that, that's correct, ma'am. I mean, okay. for, for the purpose of, of the fact that there is the law that requires you as the board to submit a budget proposal to the governor's office, right, by that timeline or under that timeline, you do that. That doesn't mean that as more information comes in uh, that you can't make adjustments with the governor's office and the legislature. I mean, if, you know, fair is fair. There's there's a lot of um, support and recognition that. So so the the time frame year to year is the September to September time frame for uh, the data that's needed to compute whatever that percentage of the inflationary adjustment itself is going to be. So where we have four years and eleven months worth of the five years of data, we're not going to have that till after you meet in October. Right. So there is room to 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 make your adjustments because the governor puts out his budget or his pro proposal to the legislature, typically somewhere around the last week in November, early December. So we're very good. We have a very good relationship with the governor's office to where if if there was some other details that came available to do it, we just really try to make sure that, you know, we're following the law. And that you're provided, you the board are directing whatever requests you need to meet these different um, milestones or gates, if you will, in the process leading up to when the gavel drops in the legislative session. So, yeah, there, there's Thank room. You. For, there's always room for changes. Yes. Thank you. We Thank have you. Superintendent Dixon and then um, Board Member Earl, and then we're going to vote because we're we're ten minutes past ending time, and we've already you know, a few days ago, extended this meeting to 3.30. I know people have things. So I could stay all night. <laughs> Madam Chair, my um, comment is not germane to the motion. So I'll wait. It's just a question so that staff knows what to do with the okay. remaining eight cases moving forward. So I'll acquiesce to Board Member Earl if that's okay. Okay, Member Earl. Just one more question. We aren't, when we meet to do our prioritization, we're not going to say, please try to keep within a 400,000, right? It, it's once again, the sky's- yeah, Because we don't have any numbers given to us. We don't have revenue given right, to us. Right, right. So that's- that's Always frustrating. Be the heartburn here because it's not really priorities the way I would normally do priorities in my own home and business <laughs> and everything. This is, this is such an odd thing that it just doesn't feel right. Yeah, it always <laughs> so, is. Yes, thank you. Duly noted. Superintendent Dixon, did you want to hey, go ahead yes. and ask you? Well, go ahead and, and take your vote. I just want to ask about the eight remaining um, the eight remaining cases. Okay. Just so there everybody leaves okay. this meeting we have on the same page. Okay, we have a motion on the table that the board amends the WPU value increase business case to be a 6.5% increase to the value of the WPU above the amount automatically included in the base budget as described in Utah code and supports the amended business case for 2023 general session. Please vote member straight. Yes. Member Norton. Yes. <coughs> member Moss. Yes. Member Heim, member Lear. Carol Lear. I don't see her chair. She left. Um, and member, we lost member Hymas. Um, member Hutchings? Yes. Member Hart? Yes. Member Earl? Yes, but I want a budget in the future. <laughs> you won't get one. <laughs> we all do. Member Klein? Yes. <laughs> member Cannon? Yes. Member Belknap? Yes. And member Davis says yes, that passes unanimously. Thank you, everyone. Um, Superintendent Dixon, quick question from you. Yes, thank you. So we have eight uh, cases in the yellow that didn't go forward. And just for 
the sake of board members who will likely ask between now and the October meeting, and our staff who uh, prepared these from a variety of sources, wh what do you anticipate as a board doing or not doing with these? I, I think we need clarification. Will these be brought up again? Will they be just on a placeholder somewhere? Can you just clarify so that everybody leaves here on the same page? This is what I understand. Someone correct me if I'm wrong. These will not be considered for prioritization. Um, I, I do think if someone in the future wants to say, just like we do with any laws that come up throughout in any board meeting or session, that we want to add a support, a voice of support. I think those can be brought up to be a voice of support, but they won't be included in this list to prioritize that we're starting right now. Is that your understanding, everybody? Is, is there anyone that, that does not see it this way? So there, that's how we'll proceed, Superintendent Dixon. Ma'am. Yes, uh, Deputy Superintendent Jones. So, so okay, I, I need some help then understanding this because my understanding was was if if these are not in the green, they will not be brought up again. So, so I don't I, think that we. I mean, I I think that we can suggest that that be the case, but I don't think procedurally we can say to board members you you can't ever bring this up. I think we can say they're not going to be in the list that we get that we work on this month, I think we can say, you know, there, there may not be time whenever it does to get a decent business case made, but procedurally, just like we'll have bills come up throughout the session, I don't know that we can say or limit the board member's right to say, we, we want to support this. Now, board members, just to be clear, if we don't have a voice of support on these cases, that doesn't mean that legislators who've supported these in the past or who want this can't go to our staff and ask for information. Right. Right. They certainly right. can get information, but these, these will not be included in a list of things that, that the board supports, even outside of our priorities. So if there's you know some heartburn there, then someone at some point later may need to say, you know, we want to support this, but um, as for right now, this these are not going to be included in the list. Vice Chair, yes. just just to add to that, they will not be included in the list, and they are we don't have any plans at at this time to bring them forward again in a board meeting. So it would have to come in reverse. The legislature would have to pick up on something and bring it forward. And can we get an updated list now that today's meetings? completed with all the greens going forward? I think they did it along the way, Kristen. Okay, good, thank you. That's a bummer, because I, I do like that computer science one, but we we have what we have at this point. Member Strait? Yeah, I, I know everyone has been frustrated at some point, either with this process or the old process, all the different processes we've had. You know, one thing I'd like to really see in the future is because I don't want to I don't want to attack this process right now. But I would like to see every case get its hearing because we get bogged down in these in these cases. And and sometimes I'm not sure that the prioritization of how these are presented other than <coughs> Jews. But I would have gladly brought up several of these others. We just ran out of time. But anyway, I appreciate the process. I respect the process we did this year. And I also respected the process we used last year. No, but I think everyone tricky. needs their hearing. Last year, everyone had their hearing and board members were frustrated about that and didn't want everyone to have their hearing. So exactly, it's, it's, it's difficult, you know, trying to manage the expectations of the entire board, but your, your comments certainly are, are duly noted and maybe we can find a hybrid in the future. Well, we've spent six hours uh, on business cases. Of, only, yeah, just we have business. spent a lot of time and, and the, uh, the process has been, um, uh, driven by board member requests initially and then created with board member and staff collaboration 
And maybe as we continue next year, we can find even better ways to communicate between all of the parties and <clears throat> find even better processes. So, and this doesn't mean that it's totally over. I mean, if there's something you feel strongly about on this and an agenda item comes up again in finance, you know, there's nothing that precludes you from saying, I want to say that this is added to the supported list, even though it, it, it wouldn't be ideal. Vice Chair, I'm not sure exact, that's exactly it. If a two, if three board members want to add it to an agenda item, it can go to the executive committee to be added to there. Correct. It, it, that's why yeah. I said oh, if okay. there is We're an agenda the item that is legislative asks, that's different. Yeah, it would have to be through the process. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Okay. okay. And we're on the same page. Thank you. Have a wonderful weekend. We're 15 minutes over, but, but I hope you have a great weekend and we'll, we'll see you next time. Thanks everybody. Thanks vice chair. Have Thank a heavy you. lift. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.